Well, welcome to Drakewell Museum and Parks Gravestone Cleaning and Preservation Workshop. My name is Sarah Goodman. I am the museum educator and your moderator for this evening. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Drakewell Museum and Park, we are located in Titusville, Pennsylvania and are one of 21 historic sites owned by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And we are administrated by the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. Drake Well preserves and interprets the site of the Drake Well, chronicling the birth and development of the petroleum industry in Pennsylvania and its growth into a global enterprise. We are pleased to have you join us this evening and would like to thank Juliet Hilburn for presenting and helping us celebrate Preservation Month. And we would also like to thank our partner, um, the Friends of Drake Well Incorporated, for helping the museum bring this program to you this evening. I would like to go over some logistics before we get started. Just a reminder that your camera will remain off and your microphones have been muted for the duration of the program. If you would like to ask a question, use the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will hold most of the questions um, for the Q&A period after Juliet's presentation so that she can address them all um, and to all the attendees. Um, but I will be monitoring the Q&A. Um, if there are any questions that I can immediately answer, I will do that. Um, I'll also, uh, please feel free also to use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen if you would like to make a comment or converse with your fellow attendees. And I'll also be monitoring the chat if there are any questions that appear there. Um, so without uh, further ado, I'd like to present this evening's uh, presenter, Juliet Hilburn. Juliet is a real estate specialist with the Allegheny Realty Settlement, a subsidiary of Schaefer Law Firm. She holds a bachelor's degree in history with a concentration in public history from Mercyhurst University. Her senior project in 2018 was to clean and map the gravestones of Ridgeway Cemetery in Hightown. And finally, I will turn the program over to Juliet um, and get things started. So thank you, Juliet. All right, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, thanks everyone for coming tonight. Um, uh, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about gravestone cleaning and preservation tonight. Uh, typically, I would have this program in an actual graveyard and we'd actually do the stone cleaning and everything, but with COVID this year, we decided to play it safe and, and go the Zoom route. So I am going to have um, a video to show of a stone that I cleaned this weekend. Um, so I will be narrating through the video and showing you uh, what the actual process looks like. Um, so just a little bit more about me. Uh, Sarah already gave me a good introduction. Uh, I did get my bachelor's degree in history and uh, preservation of Ridgeway Cemetery in Hightown was my senior project. And it really was the, the idea of my sister, <laughs> Jessica Hilburn, um, who actually gave a presentation for Drakewell just a few months ago. Um, she had the idea to, to do stone cleaning as, a, as my senior project uh, in, pub, in the public history program. Um, and she was really uh, interested in it just from uh, just seeing graveyards in the area and, and wanting to, to know more about the people in them and be able to, to actually appreciate the stone more and be able to, to see the inscriptions. Um, so that is what I chose to do for my project. And I started researching and I realized that, oh my gosh, there's like an entire science behind this. Um, and there's a methodology um, and there's a rationale behind everything. So um, I actually kind of got in, into it that way. And ever since I've been doing gravestone preservation cleaning workshops, um, I've done workshops at Greendale Cemetery in Meadville with Benson Memorial Library at Black Ash Cemetery out toward Chapmanville and at Mealtown Cemetery out in Mealtown. Um, in 2018, I was actually able to go to a workshop myself. It was put on by the Preservation Trades Network in Frederick, Maryland uh, in the Francis Scott Key Cemetery, which was really, really fun. Um, and I actually got to meet some of the big names in gravestone preservation. Um, and it was, it was uh, I actually got to meet one of my personal heroes, Jason Church from the uh, National Park Service. 
So things to remember, uh, these are just some things that you should think about before you go out to clean a gravestone. Uh, the first thing is that you should probably ask before you clean. If it is your relative, uh, usually it's okay, but you might still wanna check in with the, the cemetery caretaker just to make sure that they're not mowing the grass that day uh, because you don't wanna you know, get grass shavings all over your stone while you're cleaning. That's never good. Um, and you obviously you don't wanna be in anybody's way. So make sure you ask, get permission. If it's not your relative, uh, you should definitely get permission um, and you can ask the uh, the cemetery board or the caretaker of the cemetery, the sexton. If it's a church cemetery, you'll want to ask the church. And sometimes bigger cemeteries will have an actual office uh, with, with a caretaker's office. So you can go in and stop in and ask them as well. Uh, another thing you want to do is check the weather. You don't want to be cleaning in the rain, even though you can. It's not recommended. You're going to lose a lot of product. Um, and it's generally just not fun to clean in the rain. Uh, it's, it's just not a, a very good time if you're standing in the middle of a rainstorm in the cemetery. Um, so definitely check the weather. Another thing that you want to watch out for is that you want to make sure that it's not going to freeze the overnight. Um, make sure that you're not cleaning in um, like the winter kind of weather. Anything under usually about 45 degrees is a little too cold. So make sure that you are aiming more toward late spring, summer, uh, early fall. You don't wanna be cleaning when the temperature is gonna be dipping and shooting back up and dipping. Um, and then the one last thing that you should always keep in mind is that stones are artifacts. You can't replace them. Stones that have, have, have were created in the 19th century, you cannot replace them. Um, so be respectful of them. And just remember that gravestones are an architectural link to our past. They have incredible craftsmanship, incredible artistry, um, and just be careful uh, not to do anything that could damage them. So I wanted to go over some common stone types that you might see uh, in a cemetery, because that is important to kind of know what you're working with before you start cleaning. Um, the two earliest stone types in American cemeteries are slate and sandstone. So slate and sandstone, their years are about 1650s up until about 1900. And most, uh, mostly the slate and the sandstone you're gonna see in New England. So like Massachusetts, Connecticut, um, kind of like the Eastern seaboard. Uh, you're not gonna see as much of those kind of stones here. Uh, actually, you're going to see more of this, the, the marble and the limestone here um, because the marble and limestone became more popular to use uh, toward the 17, 1780s all the way up until about 1930. Um, so slate and sandstone are a little bit different. Um, slate, of course, is a darker gray color. Usually the, the inscriptions on slate are pretty shallow, but they're still very readable. Um, so that's... Uh, it's really interesting when you see like a slate gravestone that the inscription is usually able to be read. Um, sandstone, uh, the layers tend to separate on it. It is a sedimentary rock. Um, so it's, it can tend to, to, to separate. We call that delamination. Marble and limestone, like I said, those are going to be the ones that you're mostly seeing in our cemeteries. Uh, marble is white with a satin finish. It can also be gray. Um, gray marble, uh, is, was really commonly ordered from the Sears Roebuck catalog. <laughs> and that is absolutely true. You could order a gravestone from Sears Roebuck. <laughs> um, and, and that happened uh, quite extensively in the early 1900s, from 1900 to about 1950. Um, it was really popular to order your gravestone from a catalog. Um, so uh, limestone is also, uh, it was also pretty well used in the same time period as marble. It's a little more gray, it's a little bit darker, but both are really porous stones. So you're gonna notice that, that limestone and marble gravestones can get really dirty and they can get really nasty. Um, so, and they're, and they're really susceptible to, to weathering. They're likely to be stained and pitted. Um, so those are the ones that you're mostly gonna be doing the cleaning on. Uh, the most popular kind of stone today, of course, is granite. And, and that started in about the 1860s all the way up until today. Um, and it will, of course, continue because granite is the most durable of all the rocks. It's not acid sensitive. It's very, very strong. It's not likely to be stained or, 
or to grow mold inside it because um, it's not porous like marble is. Um, so it's really, it's the stone of choice today and it comes in a huge variety of colors. So most of the, the granite gray stones you're gonna see are gray, but in some cases they can be pink. I see in pink granite gravestones. In fact, there's a pink granite gravestone in Ridgeway Cemetery. Um, so you, you will see the run the gamut of colors for granite. All right, so those are the, the most common types of stones. One, one that I don't have on the slide, but that's really, really interesting, and you might see some around here, are monumental bronze headstones. And they are actually metal, and they're hollow on the inside. So if you tap on them, they're hollow. Um, and those were actually also ordered from the Sears Robot catalogs. Um, and they have kind of like screw in panels that for decoration, and you could customize your panels. Um, and then you could change them out as you as you wanted to. And you can also clean those stones, but they just um, they just say just use water and a gentle brush to clean them because they don't usually have anything biological on them. They, they, they might have like a, a little bit of like a protective coating that's, that's developed over time. Uh, so that, that is a type of gray stone that is also out there and you might see, uh, and those are actually really, really cool to see. Um, one thing that you should keep in mind too is that headstones move. So uh, what do I mean by that? I mean, um, headstones are sometimes not in the same position or in the same area that they were in when they were placed. Uh, and that's because sometimes headstones are stolen. Um, sometimes, uh, and this especially happens in the South with hurricanes, the weather uh, will, will move stones. Um, and then of course, if you have a cemetery on a hill or a knoll, your stones can um, kind of slide down the hill over time with soil erosion. Um, so sometimes a conservator needs to be a detective because they have to, to find where the stones have gone. So here are some of the most common threats to gravestones. Um, dirt, of course, any kind of biological bacteria or uh, biological material, um, bacteria, moss, lichens, um, all of those can get inside a gravestone. Um, you wouldn't really think about it, but moss actually has roots that grow inside the gravestone and can do a lot of damage. Um, and, and dirt can also store moisture, which can create mold and, mold and mildew on the stone. Bacterial acids are a really big problem because they actually attack the stone on a, mon on a molecular level. Um, so it, these are all things that can penetrate the stone and can cause a lot of damage over time. Freeze thaw cycles. We live in Northwestern Pennsylvania. It gets hot in the day and cold at night sometimes. Um, so what happens is that when this happens, uh, water that got into the stone over the course of the day at night freezes. And while water freezes, it expands. And that can actually break the stone open from the inside. Uh, a lot, uh, it's usually what happens to our roads. So, you know, the same thing that can break open a road can break open a gravestone. Pollution. Uh, this particularly impacts marble. Um, in uh, acid rain, especially, leaves deposits on the surface of a stone, and it can dissolve the stone over time. Trees are a huge issue. Um, you do not want to be buried under a tree. Make sure that you are not buried under a tree because tree roots like to come up and break the stone apart from the bottom. Um, I've seen gravestones that have trees growing around them. I've seen gravestones that are being toppled over by tree roots. Um, so just try to stay away from the trees. Um, and then also there's the issue of sap. Sap has sugar in it and that can attract insects and it provides food for mold. So uh, you definitely don't want to be too close to a tree that's going to be leaking sap all over your gravestone. Uh, and then finally, improper cleaning. Improper cleaning is one of the biggest threats. It can really accelerate deterioration of a gravestone. Um, and it can be really, really hard or sometimes impossible to reverse those effects. So what do I mean by improper cleaning? Um, I mean any of these methods that you see on the screen right now. So shaving cream, a lot of people like to put shaving cream on the stone in order to see the inscription. That is a no-no. Uh, shaving cream has oils and moisture in it that can actually penetrate into the pores. Remember I said that marble is porous, so it's gonna get into those pores and those fats and those oils 
those are going to have uh, a lot of food in them for bacteria, fungi, mold. Uh, they're going to attract dirt. You do not want to get that inside the stone because that's just going to speed up the biological deterioration. Bleach. This is a big one. A lot of people think I can just hose it down with bleach. No, bleach actually has salt in it. So if you leave salt in the pores of a gravestone, what happens is salt crystallizes. So when that salt, when those salts in the cracks of the gravestone crystallize, they're going to break the stone apart, much like freezing water. So that's a no. Uh, pressure washing and sandblasting. Every time you clean a layer, every time you clean a gravestone, even when you use the gentlest method possible, you are removing a layer of stone. When you use a pressure washer or a sandblaster, you are removing a huge layer of stone. So what's going to happen is it removes the original surface and it makes it more susceptible to weathering. So the weather is going to erode away the inscription quicker and it's going to leave behind a layer that's softer and even more prone to um, the soiling of the, the moss and lichens and the bacteria, all of that. Uh, one thing that you commonly see with pressure washing and sandblasting, it creates what's called sugaring. And that is basically the new surface of the stone, that's the, the weaker surface of the stone. And when you touch it, it feels kind of like sugar. It's grainy. Um, so that's definitely not what you want because it, it's, it's eroding. And if you look at the picture on the screen, that's actually a stone that has been cleaned by pressure washing. It's not something you want to do because that gravestone, you can't read any of it anymore. It's completely obliterated. Household cleaning agents. These are not generally safe to use on gravestones. A lot of them have salt in them. A lot of them have some harsh chemicals. Um, so I don't recommend just taking your 409, taking your Fantastic and going out and cleaning the gravestones. Like I said earlier, gravestones are historic. You don't want to hurt them. You want to be nice to them. And household cleaning agents are pretty harsh. Metal instruments. Anytime you use something metal, it is going to remove a larger layer of stone than you want. It's going to erode the stone. So just like with the pressure washing and the sandblasting, they're too rough. Don't use anything metal. Steel wool, same thing. Um, steel wool is scratchy and it's metal. Scratchy plus metal equals bad. So really the name of the game is do no harm. You want to be nice to the stone. You don't want to clean it more than once a year and you want to be so gentle with it. Um, one thing that you want to think about before you even start to clean is, should I clean this stone? If the stone is already really far gone, if you notice the sugaring, um, if it's in a really, really bad shape, you might not want to clean it. Um, I know it can be tempting to kind of want to try to, to fix it, but some stones are just too far gone. And by cleaning it, you're just going to make it worse. Um, so be careful there. Um, another thing that you want to think about that was, um, I, I had left off that earlier slide is safety. So if a stone is really, really big, but it's also really, really unstable, and you think you're going to have to work over your head, be careful. I wouldn't clean a stone like that because you don't want it to fall on you while you're cleaning it. Um, so do no harm, be gentle, no more than once a year, because you are removing a layer of stone every time you clean. Don't do it more than once a year. So this is just a list of basic supplies that you would need to go and clean a gravestone. My go-to cleaner is D2 Biological Solution. This stuff is just the best. I love D2. It is highly recommended by preservationists and I have an entire slide to talk about it. So I'm not gonna talk too much on this slide, um, but just keep that in your mind, D2 Biological Solution. Uh, gallon garden sprayer, that would be it for your water. Um, you can pick these up at any kind of true value, any Walmart. Uh, I have one at the bottom of the screen. That's kind of what they look like. These are really good for cleaning stones because they're very gentle and they do hold a lot of water. When you are at a gravestone uh, cleaning, you probably are not going to have access to running water. So you will want need to bring it with you. So a gallon garden spray is a really good way to keep your water and spray it. Um, I use distilled water. It's really, it's really a toss up. Um, I know at home, we, our water is very hard. So I don't, we don't wanna put that on the gravestone. Um, but if you live in the city and you have municipal water that's filtered, uh, you could probably get away with using that water. However, I don't wanna chance it. 
uh, I would I would still get the distilled water. It's really cheap. It already comes in a uh, gallon size and you can bring it with you pretty easily and it's very portable. So I would I would recommend distilled water and a bucket to carry all your stuff and to wash off your, your equipment. Um, some things you can use on the stone, a uh, paint stirrer, they come with paint. You can get them for free at any Walmart, any true value. You can just ask, hey, can I have some of your wooden paint stirrers? And usually they say, sure, here you go. And those are great for scraping things off stones. Plastic scrapers, anything wood or plastic you can use. Wood and plastic is good, metal is bad. Uh, plastic scraper, the one at the bottom of the screen is something uh, that you could potentially use. Any kind of putty knife, um, as long as it's plastic, it'll be fine. Toothpicks, toothbrushes to get into the kind of like the small crevices. They're really great for detail work if you have a stone that has um, a really detailed inscription or perhaps like a carved um, icon on it. You, you'll want to have those to be able to do the detail work. A soft bristle brush, I recommend getting a, a natural bristle brush. You can also get a um, artificial one like a nylon. Those ones, uh, they, they kind of wear down more quickly. I prefer the natural. And if you don't want to get uh, a whole lot of uh, dirt on your hands, I would bring some PPE. Of course, after this year, everybody knows what PPE is, um, but I would recommend having at least gloves. Um, I, I would definitely recommend gloves because you, you probably don't want to get uh, nasty uh, uh, kind of dirt and all that that's going to come off the stone. And also, you probably don't want to keep that D2 on your hands for too long either. Um, so I recommend gloves at least. You can use um, goggles. That would also be a good idea. I don't typically use goggles, but if you're afraid of something kind of hitting you in the eye as you're scrubbing, goggles are obviously um, the way you want to go. All right, so D2 Biological Solution, this is my go-to. Uh, it, um, it is what the National Park Service uses to clean the stones in Arlington National Cemetery. It is the gold standard. It is recommend, highly recommended by conservationists. It's non-toxic. It's a biocide, which means that it kills um, any kind of biological material. It's got a five-year shelf life. So once you buy it, you got to use it in the five years. And it works on a, kind of like a, a whole different group of uh, materials. So it works on marble, granite, limestone, concrete, all of those materials you can use it on. Uh, it works best in temperatures over 45. Of course, you don't really want to clean in under 45 degrees anyway. Uh, it, like I said, it's highly recommended. You can buy it right online. Um, usually I go through Limeworks. It is a little expensive. Um, so the quart size here is $18.95 plus shipping. Um, the, uh, uh, the larger sizes are obviously a little more expensive as well. Um, so some people like to dilute it when they use it. I don't usually dilute it. I don't really recommend that. The first time you clean a stone, you definitely don't want to dilute it. Um, but you can eventually, um, if you're just going back to, to spray the stone again after you've um, cleaned it once already. Um, but it is, it is a little expensive. So uh, try, to, try to make it stretch as much as possible. Other alternatives that are approved by conservationists are Orvis Soap and Revive. I have not used either one of those. I only use D2, so I can't really speak to how they, how they work, um, but they're both well-tested and, and they both get high marks from the National Park Service. So here's a, kind of like a flow chart showing what the steps are. Uh, obviously, before you start, definitely take a photograph. And if it's a multi-sided stone, you can take photographs of each side, just so you have, number one, so that you have documentation of what the stone looked like and number two, so that you can feel good after you clean the stone and you can, you can have your before and after photographs. Uh, the first thing you wanna do is wet the stone with water and then, and then you can go ahead and scrape any surface level stuff off the top. So the moss, the lichens, anything that you can see on the top you could scrape right off. And I recommend using that paint stirrer to do that, that or the, um, uh, the putty knife, either one. They work really, really well for that. Um, the, the next step after you've scraped any kind of surface level stuff off is um, you haven't actually gotten underneath the surface. So when you scrape that stuff off the surface, there's still like a root system underneath in the stone. So what you want to do is spray D2 all over the stone and let it sit for about 10 minutes. 
10 minutes is what they recommend. Usually don't wait quite that long, um, but you can wait 10 minutes if you have 10 minutes to wait uh, to kind of let it soak in and let it start working. And when you're spraying, you are gonna notice that when it hits biological material, the spray, it's gonna foam up a little bit. Uh, and that's a good thing. The next you're gonna, uh, if you, if you, uh, if just the stone has kind of dried because and a lot, a lot of times when you're cleaning in the summertime, it's gonna dry within that 10 minutes. So that's okay. Just re-wet the, the stone with water and then wet your brush and then start scrubbing. Um, when you're cleaning, when it's really hot in the summer, you're gonna wanna rinse while you're brushing um, as you go and don't just clean the whole stone and then you get back to the beginning and you're like, well, it dried. You don't want the lather to dry on the stone. So rinse as needed. Um, and then you can repeat steps five and six. So you uh, continue brushing and rinsing until uh, you're satisfied. And then finally you let the stone dry and you take your after photograph. So that, that is the, the steps with using the D2 biological solution. So I did take this video of cleaning a graystone. This is a graystone I cleaned um, just last weekend. This is in Newtontown Cemetery. It's uh, off, just off Mystic Park Road. It's, um, it's right there, uh, right off the intersection of uh, Mystic Park and Rosenberg Road in Hightown. Um, and this was a stone that I had found in the cemetery. The cemetery is uh, kind of like in the middle of the woods, so nobody's really taking care of it. Um, so what I did was I found a veteran's grave because um, we're, we're coming upon Memorial Day, so I wanted to, to kind of um, pay my respects to a veteran's grave. Um, so I chose this grave. Uh, it's obviously uh, weathered. It's been outside for a long time. Um, so we are going to watch and I'll narrate as we go. So this was the before shot that we took of the grave. This is wetting the stone. So that's just regular water. You'll see that I have a pump sprayer in my hands. Uh, my pump sprayer actually broke right before I took this video. So what I'm doing is I'm just sort of uh, splashing the water on the stone because my pump sprayer isn't really working. <laughs> so it, you, you have what, what you can use. So just, you know, do your best with what you have. Um, obviously the pump sprayer working is the best case scenario, but that doesn't always work out. So um, anything that's gentle. Um, so if you have like a, like a, even a, a garden hose, as long as it's gentle, um, as long as you're not pressure washing it, it's usually okay. Um, and then the next step, of course, is spray the D2 on the stone. And you can kind of tell that it's kind of uh, bubbling up as it hits the biological material. So I just sort of spray the stone top to bottom all the way around. And the D2 a quart size actually comes in that nice handheld bottle. So I recommend that size. Um, the gallon size comes in uh, like a gallon jug that you need to put into a spray bottle. Um, so just be aware of that if you do order the gallon size that you will need something to spray with. <laughs> and the D2 biocide works over time. Um, one thing you can do if you don't want to do the brush method is you can do a spray and leave where you just Go up to the stone, you don't even have to wet it with water. You just spray it with D2 and you just leave it and it will work over time. This method, the, the brush and rinse method is actually for immediate results. But if you don't wanna have to, to rinse the brush and rinse the stone, you can use the spray and leave. It just takes a, a bit longer for it to work. So I'm pretty well dousing it. Um, really getting into the inscription. Um, and then we wait for a while. <clears throat> oh, this is me scraping. So I have my painter. Uh, before we started, there was actually quite a few weeds around the stone. So what we ended up doing was clearing them. Uh, one thing that you might want to bring with you if you are in a cemetery like I was in the middle of the woods is a pair of clippers. Uh, something to clip uh, especially if there's like saplings growing around the tree, uh, something to clip them from the ground so that they don't get in your way. And that is scraping off the moss.
just sort of clearing around the stone. Um, and the D2 will kill whatever you spray it on, whatever kind of biological material you spray it on. So if there are flowers, um, like if somebody's planted flowers at the base of the stone, which sometimes people do, um, you will want to rinse it off the flowers before you leave. Um, you just rinse them really well, it should be okay. Um, but definitely don't leave it on there because it will kill the flowers. So still scraping. So I kind of uh, go toward the top of the stone. You'll notice that the top of the stone has a lot more discoloration and a lot more stuff going on than the bottom. Um, so that's why we're kind of focusing at the top, trying to get off as much surface level stuff as we can for now. Uh, also, when you're spraying the D2, um, be careful because if there's bugs living in the stone, uh, they may scutter away um, and come out at you while you're spraying. Um, that has happened to me. Um, so just be, just be mindful of that. Um, it might happen. Another good reason to wear gloves. Uh, and this is just re-wetting the stone because it did sit for a while and it was very hot that morning. Um, it was like 80 degrees that morning and humid. So we went ahead and we redoused the stone before we started scrubbing. Um, the next step, we're gonna be rinsing our natural bristled brush um, and make sure you always do that. Um, you never want to brush a dry brush across the stone. Always make sure it is wet. You'll notice that we have an extra jug of gallon, uh, gallon of water for uh, rinsing our brush. And that is a good to have. For this stone, we use three gallons of distilled water. So we brought with us two gallons in the pump sprayer, which actually turned out to be more of a pump pourer because the sprayer wasn't working. Uh, but and then the, the, the third gallon we used to rinse our brush. So I, st I always start at the top of the stone and work my way to the bottom. Uh, the, the experts are kind of divided on that. Um, some of them actually tell you to start from the bottom and work your way to the top. I always learn to clean from top to bottom. So that's always what I do. I haven't really noticed any difference because um, the D2 is going to work over time anyway. This is really just taking off the surface level stuff. So you'll see that it's working itself into a lather. That's supposed to happen. Um, yeah, uh, and then once once I rinse the stone, you'll really be able to tell um, that the lather is the D2 mixed with uh, the dirt and stuff that's coming off from the top of the stone. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. So we are rinsing the stone and you can see stuff coming up the top. Um, Somebody mentioned in the chat not to use the municipal water because it is full of chlorine. That is a very good point. Um, I do not live in a city. Uh, so I just had got in the habit of not using the water at all because our, our water is full of minerals and I didn't really wanna put that on the stone. So if you are in the city, you probably don't wanna use your water either because it's got chlorine in it. Um, so definitely go with the distilled water. It's the safest choice. It's cheap and it's portable. Uh, you notice something that I just did was I rinsed the stone, or excuse me, I rinsed my brush uh, with the water from the jug, and I did not dunk it in the in the bucket. And there's a reason for that. So when you dunk your brush in the bucket, you are creating dirty water, which is going to sit in that bucket. And when you go to redunk your brush, you're just going to get more gunk on the brush, and then you're going to drag that gunk across the stone. So every time you go to rinse, make sure that you are rinsing uh, with clean water. All right, so uh, we do each side like this. And it, it was hot that day, so I did rinse side by side. 
Um, so as soon as I finished one side, I did rinse, um, and then I uh, started on the next side because we definitely don't want that lather to dry on the stone. And I'd like to thank my dear mother for coming with me in the morning that day to help video me washing a stone. Um, I dragged her through the woods. Um, so that was, it was interesting. Um, we had a lot of fun, but you do get to see her thumb in several of the shots. She is amazing. Okay. So again, rinsing our brush, making sure not to dunk it in the bucket. Um, and the bucket usually, um, sometimes I use the bucket for dirty water. Um, sometimes I use it um, just to hold stuff. So if you, when you're rinsing your brush, you can rinse your brush over the bucket to catch the dirty water. And then you can go and dispose of the water elsewhere. That's mostly for cemeteries that are really nice um, and not in the middle of the woods. In the middle of the woods, um, generally you can just rinse your brush wherever um, it's not as um, kind of uh, nice on the ground. So that is why. Um, Yep, so this is the back side of the stone. Um, in the front side, I don't know if you caught the inscription yet, it is Samuel H. Roberts. In the back of the stone are his children. Um, Samuel H. Roberts, um, Jessica actually looked up Samuel H. Roberts for us, my sister Jessica, um, and she found that he was actually a private in the 150th Infantry at Gettysburg, and he was injured at Gettysburg, but he did survive the war and he passed away. Um, I think it said in the 1890s, if I'm not mistaken, um, and he was buried right in Newtontown Cemetery, right in Hightown. So we are renting the stone. One thing I did do right before we cleaned, in addition to moving any kind of the, uh, the brush out from away from the stone so we'd have plenty of room to, to kind of walk and, and scrub and everything, um, we also kind of weeded around the stone, uh, is that I moved the flag um, it was a veteran's grave. It had a flag next to it. I moved the flag so that I wouldn't uh, step on the flag or, or get any any kind of uh, water or anything on the flag. Um, but just if you move anything, make sure to put it back, which I do at the end of the video. So those are his children, Grace and Thomas J. And you'll notice that the stone is starting to lighten up. And D2 is really interesting because D2 actually works over time. So right now what you're seeing is getting the surface level stuff off, um, but D2 is actually going to stay on the stone even after you leave in the weeks and in the months uh, after it's applied. And it actually kills the biological bacteria over that time. So if you go back uh, like even um, next week or the week after, uh, you will see visible results. You'll see it uh, start to lighten a lot more. Sometimes when you clean a stone, it'll change colors. Um, the stone might be gray when you start cleaning it, and it might appear pinkish or brown when you're done. Um, and that is because of the D2. The stone is actually fighting the D2 uh, by releasing keratin. Um, and that's what kind of creates that color, but it will go away. So no worries. Don't feel like you ruined the stone. You didn't. It's just the, it's just the stone um, kind of reacting to the D2. And the D2 really kills the root structures of the biomaterial in the stone. Um, so it will work over time. Um, and I do have some examples that I can show you and they're pretty stark. Okay, so we're rinsing our last side. Now, from what I've seen so far of this stone, I believe that it is, it is a gray marble from what I see. Uh, we'll be able to tell better uh, in, a, in the coming weeks and months when it lightens up a little bit more because it can be kind of hard to tell sometimes underneath all of the years of wear and gunk and dirt. So this is actually a small brush that I'm using. Um, I actually got this brush at the Preservation Trade Network uh, Cemetery Workshop I went to in Maryland. Um, it is about the same as a toothbrush uh, so you could definitely use a toothbrush to do this. I just really like this small brush um, because it's, it's really useful and it's a, it's a good size for doing uh, inscription work. 
And that is something uh, that you'll want to focus on is really the letters sometimes because inside the letters you can get moss and, and things kind of collect. So that's a really good thing to do is kind of focus on your details. But now I'm scrubbing the inscription on the back of the stone. Okay, trouble spots. So the top of the stone is obviously a trouble spot. Um, okay, so we are spraying the top of the stone again. You'll notice it's really foaming up if you can see that. So I doused it again, and I'm going to scrub it with the, the smaller brush. Again, nothing metal. This is a plastic brush. Anything plastic and wood is OK. So we're doing some detail work. And you want to be gentle when you're scrubbing as well. Um, this stone in particular did have a bit of a wobble, I noticed, while I was cleaning. Um, so I was just pretty careful not to tip it over onto my own head um, or, or knock it over onto the ground. Um, so just be careful when you're cleaning. You can clean a broken gravestone. Uh, there's nothing against that. Just be careful. Um, just try not to, to damage the stone or to hurt yourself in the process. All right. So gentle scrubbing, we don't want to do too much. We're going to rinse again, and you can see the dirt coming off when I do that. I just sort of grabbed the jug for this one. But pump sprayers are really great to have. Um, they're really inexpensive. Um, and and they're, uh, they're really uh, great for cleaning. Um, it's much easier than uh, kind of dumping the water over top, especially if it's a larger stone. So make sure you have plenty of water. Make sure uh, you bring extra water because you don't want to run out. Other supplies, that is another natural bristle brush that is a paint scraper as well, and toothbrushes. That is actually something that's like a large toothpick that I got at um, the same workshop where I got the smaller uh, kind of toothbrush um, adjacent tool. Uh, and those are really great. You can use a Q-tip as well for kind of carving out the, the letters and getting any material out of the lettering. Um, but I, I really, I really like that um, that tool that I got, and a toothpick would also work. So one more rinse. Whenever you rinse, it's always good to um, make sure there's not more to scrape off the top. Um, the rinsing actually loosens up any kind of moss, so that's why um, we tell you to wait until after you rinse to scrape off the moss. You can scrape it off while it's still dry, but it doesn't come off quite as easily. Now we rinse our materials once again. And make sure you clean out your brushes really well after you do a cleaning. You don't want uh, to leave your brushes dirty and then you go to clean another stone one other day and your brush is nasty. So this is our last layer of D2 and this is just a good thing to do um, to just sort of leave on the stone. Uh, like I said, you do definitely want to check that rain forecast, make sure it's not going to rain in the next 24 hours because it's just going to wash the D2 right off and you're going to lose a lot of product. And this layer of D2 is meant to work over time. So it will continue to soak into the stone. And you don't have to necessarily do another layer of D2. Like if you're out of D2, there's still 
um, plenty on the stone from when you scrubbed it, but it's, it is good measure to put more on because you did lose some while you were rinsing. And I just about used up this whole bottle of D2, um, not on this stone, um, but it was a bottle that I had already been using. Um, so I actually unscrewed the top here and just pour the last few drops on top because D2 is not cheap. <laughs> so I just try to get as much out as I could. All right. Uh, I, found, I find that uh, the D2 can stretch pretty far if you use it smart. Okay, so this is the after shot of the stone. You can see he died 1894. Um, the, the D2 can stretch pretty far. If you dilute it, uh, usually you do one part D2, five parts water. Like I said, I don't recommend that for the first time cleaning on a stone, but if you want to go back and respray the stone, maybe the year after, you can absolutely dilute it at that point. Um, when I cleaned uh, Ridgeway Cemetery a few years ago, that cemetery had about 60 stones in it, all of varying sizes. And I think I used about three of the gallon size to clean. So this is the after. And it will continue to work on the stone. So this stone will not continue to look like that. It will get lighter. Um, and I will go back and take a picture in a few months. So this is just clean up, make sure you get all your materials put away and take everything with you. You don't wanna leave anything behind. Don't be a litter bug. And of course, if you move anything, make sure you put it back. So that was our gravestone cleaning demonstration. Um, you can clean with just water. You don't have to use the D2. Um, so if you're cleaning with just water, it just removes that one step with spraying the D2. You still wet the stone, you still scrape it, um, you can re-wet the stone and then use your wet water, and, or excuse me, use your wet brush um, and go ahead and rinse as you're scrubbing. Um, so it just, it's just basically the same process, just you're not spraying the D2. After you clean, like I said, stone may appear pinkish or brown, works over time, and you can go back and spray respray yearly. Um, like I, I said earlier that you don't wanna clean more than once a year. Once you've done one time with D2, usually every year after that, you can just go back and give it another spray. You don't really even need to scrub. Um, so this was a stone in Ridgeway Cemetery that I had cleaned uh, back in the summertime. And then this was the stone in November. So there's a huge difference there. Um, it did get much, much lighter. It is a marble material um, and you can definitely read it a little bit better. This was another stone at Ridgeway, William McCombs. Um, this stone had quite a bit of moss toward the bottom. You can kind of see that in this picture. Um, and it was very discolored. It is underneath a tree, go figure. Um, so I find that gravestones underneath trees tend to get a lot more of the biological material on them. Um, so this was a really good restoration. So this photo was right before I cleaned. It was in, taken in May, and then this photo was taken in November. So just a few months, there's a huge difference there. This was a stone that I cleaned actually in Oil City. Um, uh, it was one of my coworkers' relatives um, in Oil City that I, um, I, I went over and cleaned for her. Um, this is a marble stone. And this is the cemetery. You can kind of see the, the uh, Oil City High School in the background. This is the Calvary Cemetery over there. Um, so this stone is super discolored. And what I ended up doing was using the D2 and it really turned out beautiful. Um, and it still looks like this. So I cleaned the stone uh, about two years ago, I believe. And uh, this was just taken um, last fall. Repairing broken stones. I'm not gonna go into too much detail on this because I really don't recommend it um, if you're not a trained professional. Repairing broken stones is possible. Uh, when you have a stone that is broken in half, you can use an epoxy to glue it back together essentially. Um, and the, the type of epoxy I have listed there is the one that's usually recommended. You can also reset a stone. So if the stone has tipped over or if it's kind of at an angle, um, you can reset it, you kind of dig around it, you dig underneath, and then you fill with fill in with gravel underneath the stone. And then you balance it out um, using um, like the, the balancing measure that they show there in the picture. Um, and then you cover the top with soil. And then mortise and tenon repairs is what you see in the picture. They recommend using preservation mortar for that. 
um, and then you prop it with boards to dry it. So repairs are really tricky. I don't recommend doing it unless you've been trained. Um, I did learn a little bit about it at the workshop that I went to. However, I, I wouldn't personally do it. Um, you don't wanna cause any damage or anything. Um, and it can be a, a little difficult, uh, especially if you're working with a really big stone. Here's just some recommended reading. Uh, Lynette Stringstead's The Graveyard Preservation Primer is the authoritative text on graveyards um, and stone cleaning, stone preservation. I highly recommend reading her book. Uh, and then also the National Park Service per, uh, published uh, preservation brief on preserving grave markers. It is a really good read. It's pretty short uh, and you can find it for free online. If you just Google preserving grave markers and historic cemeteries, National Park Service, it should come right up and you can print it off and read it. Um, that is a really, really good text. And it's actually written. Uh, one of the authors is Jason Church, who I met at the um, gravestone workshop that I went to in Maryland, and he is super cool and very interesting. Other sources. Um, here's just a few websites, a few organizations that do gravestone preservation. Cemetery Conservators for United Standards and the Association for Gravestone Studies are, are really great organizations. The NCPTT, that stands for National Center for Preservation Technology and Training, and they're part of the National Park Service. That's actually uh, the organization that Jason Church works for. He's part of the NCPTT, um, and they have their own kind of workshops, um, and they, they publish their own publications, so definitely check them out. And then PHMC also has some really good links on their website. Um, so I did put that link up there. You can uh, check out the PHMC website to find more uh, organizations and more sources. So um, this is the end of what I have, um, but if I can answer any questions, I'd be happy to. Uh, one extra thing that I didn't mention, but that I can mention is that uh, if you just wanna make a stone easier to read, but you don't, either A, you don't wanna clean it, or B, you don't have permission to clean it. What you can do is you can take a mirror or a flashlight and you can actually dire direct the light onto the stone using the mirror or the flashlight. And it usually makes it a little easier to read. Uh, another thing you can do is take your cell phone, take a photo and then edit it to invert the colors. Um, and that usually makes the inscription show up as well. So those are two other things that you can do in case you decide that cleaning a gray stone is just not for you or if you're not allowed to. All right, do we have any questions, Sarah? I do not see any questions as of yet, but I have one actually. Um, sure. Do you recommend gravestone rubbings? No, that is a big no. Um, if you actually look in Lynette Strangstad's book, um, mm -hmm. A Graveyard Preservation Primer, on um, one of my slides here, um, Lynette Strangstad is very much against gravestone, gravestone rubbings um, because they actually wear the surface down on the stone over time. So if you have like an entire class of uh, children, like going to a cemetery year after year and taking the Graystone rubbings, it's going to wear that stone down. So she does not um, recommend that. Name of the NPS preservation brief. Uh, Sue, I have it up on the screen. It's called Preserving Grave Markers and Historic Cemeteries. It's a really good brief. Uh, let's see. We have one here. We have one in the chat. It says, are there any groups in the region that do gravestone cleaning? I don't know of any groups. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really know of any organizations that do it. Um, I know that um, there are groups that do gravestone tours, um, like uh, Benson Memorial Library did uh, a tour of um, Woods, Woodlawn Cemetery a year or two ago. Um, the Crawford County Historical Society over in Meville does some gravestone tours um, at Greendale. And I believe they were planning to do one at one point at Benson. I'm not sure if that happened with COVID, um, but uh, yeah. So there, there are groups that do the actual tours. I don't know if there's anyone that does the cleaning other than just individuals uh, like myself. I can actually do cleaning as well. 
Um, so I have done cleaning for people who have asked me to clean gravestones for them. Uh, and I'm happy to do that. If, uh, if you have a stone that, that you would like cleaned and it's a relative of yours or something, um, I'm happy to talk with you about that. I do know that um, at least where I grew up, some of the local uh, VFWs and things and the American legions, when they, some, some of those groups, when they do put the flags out at the veterans graves, sometimes those groups do uh, cleaning too. Mm -hmm. uh, but a very basic, I think they're just water and the soft brush. I don't think they do a good thorough right, cleaning, but right. they, they tidy them up for the holidays. Mm -hmm. Yep, and um, water in a soft brush is totally okay. Um, you don't have to go out and buy the expensive D2. I do um, because I have a real passion for, for uh, preservation. Um, but water, water in a soft brush, you can't go wrong. Yep. We have one question. Um, it says, I it says, I feel awful, awful for calling it this, but the witch's grave in town, her headstone has a red tint to it. Is there any way to remove that? To remove the red tint, um, hmm, I haven't actually seen it. Um, I'd have to look at it. But if you use D two, uh, I wonder what that would kind of do. Um, it might have a red tint from uh, mold, possibly. Or oh, someone's telling me that it is. A, there's a tree there, um, so it's probably from the tree. Um, so yes, if you use D two, it should take that off. <laughs> Yeah, Jess did a lot of research actually on the witch's grave. So I believe it's on her blog, Northwest PA Stories. Um, you can read all about the witch's grave. Uh, she's very familiar with it. So she, she gave me a, a hint that it is the tree. <laughs> I have another question here. It says, uh, my, my great, -grandpa great great grandparents stone has a metal plaque on the stone that has their names. It has turned green and has black spots. Will D2 work on this? It should, absolutely. Yeah, uh, it does work on metal. Um, yeah, I, I would try it definitely. Um, what they tell you to do is if you're not sure if it's going to work, you can take a little bit and kind of rub it in kind of like an inconspicuous spot and see what happens. Um, so if you're a little nervous, that's what I would do. Um, and if it looks like it's, it's gonna work okay, uh, go ahead and clean the whole area. And then someone in the chat um, says that a lot of the DAR groups do clean stones. So they do. Yeah. Yeah, I would. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, yep. Any kind of um, service groups. Yeah, they they definitely uh, have an interest in in, in doing um, historical work, preservation work um, for sure. So, yeah. Um, so if uh, you hear of anybody uh, doing any of those. You can go and take your take your knowledge with you and and warn them against the dangers of using pressure washers and shaving cream. <laughs> well, I was I, I mean, I knew bleach was harsh, but I didn't even know it contained the salt that would be so damaging, too. So that yep. was really interesting. Bleach is very harsh. Yep, definitely. Don't use the bleach. Um, <laughs> I think Jennifer Burton uh, says that she's still hoping to have Jason Church uh, come to town, which would be super cool because he is a personal hero of mine. He's amazing. Um, <laughs> on the NCPTT website, they actually have some videos where he kind of gives uh, more information about different types of stones. So definitely check those out. Uh, he's a really knowledgeable guy. Um, so and uh, he's just awesome. I can't say enough great things about Jason Church. Um, so thank you, Jen and the ORA for uh, working to, to bring him here. I'd love to talk to him. Anyone else have any other questions or anything for us this evening? Let's see, we'll wait a minute. I just wanna thank everyone for attending this evening's program and helping us celebrate um, Preservation Month here uh, at Drake Well Museum and Park. I um, invite you to keep an eye out on our Facebook page for more upcoming events. And again, I just want to thank Juliet for her wonderful presentation and uh, 
look forward to going out one of these days here very soon and scrubbing some tombstones with you. Um, <laughs> tombstones, gravestones, what's the any kind word? um <laughs> grave uh, the one thing is that graveyard actually applies more to like earlier cemeteries than cemetery does um okay. so tombstone it's it's more kind of in the graveyard category but but gravestone that's probably closer to to what we have around here <laughs> okay well, thank you so much, Juliet. Thank you everyone for attending. As I said, uh, please check out our Facebook page and our website for um, more upcoming events. And um, don't forget that the museum is now open. We are open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from uh, 10 to 4 each day. So we look forward to seeing you on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, it was great. Uh, presenting this program and Juliet again, thank you. Everyone thank have you. a great evening. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Drake. Well, thanks, Melissa. Um, I'm actually probably going to be doing um, a hands on presentation at some point uh, with uh, Benson Memorial Library sometime early in the fall. So hopefully we'll see everybody there and uh, uh, we'll we'll see if we can pull that one out. Sounds like a fun time. I'll definitely be there. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. We'll send you the details. <laughs> Thank you so much.